I'll apologize in advance in case I kick the stand, and I also apologize for costing you the price of a stool. I had foot surgery some months ago, and with vascular issues and diabetes, the healing has been extremely slow. It's almost complete, but I'm still humoring my surgeon because I never want to see that guy again after next Thursday, and uh, it'll be a blessing if I don't. Apologize also for the funny shoes. I would normally dress a little nicer, but uh, we take care of the foot as best we can. Philip is correct. There are two ways we can do class tonight. I talk for a living, so I can talk for 42 minutes. Or we can do this the intelligent way where you choose to help us. If you help us, we learn more. We have a broader perspective because you're good students of the Bible. And I'm less boring if you talk. So it's a win-win sort of situation. I do appreciate the kindness of the elders and Philip in inviting us to be here. Two or three things I can promise you. I'm fairly obedient about time, so I'll stop at the designated time. I'm certainly obedient about topics because I respect the series and the planning that goes into it. And I don't know much except Bible. So what I want us to do is think together biblically and appreciate the fact that we do that. The other promise that I make you is that if you choose to help us with comments, I will be appreciative. It's not my nature to cut people off or cut them off at the knees or anything like that. That's poor form and really dumb. Transformation through celebration. We are to be transformed, Paul writes, by the renewing of our mind. We get our thinking right. We align it with God and Bible. As we align our thinking, we align our behavior. We do what God teaches us to do. And as we align our thinking and our behavior with the Bible, our emotions eventually follow. We come to appreciate and feel rewarded and enjoy our service for God. We sometimes do okay with celebration and sometimes not. It's not a common word in most translations of Scripture, but joy is. And so we'll read a number of joy passages because they have directly to do with transformation and celebration. There's some things that people around us, even folks who are unchurched, do a pretty good job of celebrating. In our culture, what do we do a good job of celebrating? Fourth of July coming up. Firecrackers, hot dogs, grill out, hamburger, red, white, and blue. Christmas. We love it. Uh, we know it's not really Jesus' birthday, but we read Romans 14 and we don't care uh, there. We're not trying to change or add to Scripture. We're just glad for the world to appreciate and think of Jesus at least that time during the year. Other things? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving favorite holiday. Food, family, football. It's got all those bases covered. Birthdays. Birthdays. I don't celebrate mine anymore. The next one will be 66. I read the obits. We still get the paper. And Philip, you would know me well enough to know this. In the obits, there are two categories. Younger than Bill and older than Bill. And any given day, when I get four or five people in there who've passed away and they're younger than me, that's pretty sobering and invites me to celebrate life. So I'm pretty happy there. We celebrate wedding anniversaries and the birth of new baby and grandbaby and do great things. And I love that as long as those things are sober and not pagan, I'm real happy. But in the church, maybe we don't do as much celebrating. Even though God is extremely pro-joy. If you did the concordance kind of thing, I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly won't come up under joy. But it has a lot to do with joy. You think about the latter part of Acts chapter 2. After about 3,000 have put on Christ in baptism for remission of sins, 
So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness. There's our joy word. And simplicity of heart. Praising God, another joy term. And having favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You think about joy passages from the New Testament in particular. We love Acts 3 in verse 19. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out and that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. We love Acts 2.38. We love Acts 3.19. We love the sins being washed away. But I hope we also love the seasons of refreshing more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who need no repentance. We could do passage after passage. You think of Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. That's our next Berean book that we're working on for 2023. Love Joy, second on that list, only to love, and extremely important there. And then we think about the idea of Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. I want to be careful. I know you're good students, and I appreciate that. I want to ask you, why would some Christians hesitate to celebrate great things, especially spiritual things. Why might some Christians be a bit hesitant about godly celebration of great victories? Thank you, sir. That is a near perfect comment. They think wrongly, and you didn't say that because you're not rude. That they might not be humble. They might be prideful. Uh, nothing prideful in celebration unless it's the wrong kind of celebration. The na 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 in your face kind of stuff that puts other people down. Or the exceptionalism stuff. I'm being blessed because I'm such a wonderful person. And the fact that you're not, that just tells you what a wonderful person I am. That stinks up anywhere. It, it just makes a mess of things. So that's a good, solid we want to stay away from that. Other reasons some Christians might be hesitant to celebrate. I love my dad. He's 93 now and won't be in this world much longer. But he's lived a happy and full life. Christian. In his better days, farming... Cows, corn, pigs, and peanuts way back when. He was always a little reluctant to celebrate. Good looking calf crop, fine litter of pigs, the corn looking great at this stage. Because in his heart and in his mind, celebrating might call the devil's attention to that. A lot like Job 1, Job 2. And if you go celebrating, We've seen corn crops that look just as beautiful as could be, but the rain quit and you never gathered a grain. One year, the hurricane came through and blew it all flat, and they were able to gather a minimal amount running the combine on the ground wrong way against the grain and picking up some, and it just turned out to be a mess and a mess. But he's learned in his latter years not to do business that way, don't let the fact that bad things happen or could happen rob you of the celebration right now. I think some people look at celebration and they think about it in terms of, since the Bible does not often use a word like celebration exactly, maybe we would be outside of Bible to be doing that. And then I've even heard a few people talk about celebration in terms of it's silly, Flippant, it's not serious. Well, I'm in favor of serious celebration. And I mean serious, godly celebration. I don't know, for example, your custom when somebody is baptized into Christ. But I suspect that part of your celebration includes warm embrace, 
handshake, pat on back, commendation. It may even include a special song or a special prayer or special invitations. It may include some of you texting, tweeting, sending cards to that person, telling them how much you welcome them into the kingdom of God and into the fellowship. And I just love all of that. We think about joy. That's part of what we're talking about tonight. The second part of what we're thinking about tonight is being transformed by celebration. I don't know about you, but I need continual transformation. We've been married now for 42 years. She's still transforming me. She keeps me because too much is invested to start training another one. But I'm resistant. Uh, I, I don't always do things right. I get real dumb sometimes. And I regress from time to time. All, all of that's just true as it can, can be. But the training is important. The transformation is ongoing. I have no technology skills. I appreciate people who can do sound systems and PowerPoints and all of that kind of stuff. We have stopped the cash register at Walmart by standing in that line. Twice. All we did was get in that line and that beast quit working. I don't know, understand that at all. I have taken a PowerPoint to a place a time or two and their PowerPoint system hasn't worked right since. So I don't even do that to you nice people because it's a little bit on the dangerous side. We're thinking about Philippians chapter 4, which doesn't surprise you at all. Beginning with verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your patience be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus and then verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, think on these things. You know, when we talk about celebration and spiritual joy, we're talking about something bigger, broader, deeper, and better than happiness in the moment. I have nothing against happiness in the moment. If you want to hand me a neatly folded hundred on the way out, I'll be happy in the moment and I will not turn it down. If you just want to say nice tie, I'm good with that and happy in the moment. If you say something nice about Laura, it's even better. That's a win-win sort of situation. We're not anti-happy, but it is a little important for us to think about this a minute. What are the fundamental differences between biblical joy and mere happiness? How do you differentiate biblical joy and mere happiness? Happiness is fleeting. Being diabetic, I'm supposed to really watch the carbs. One of the ladies at Salem who loves us brought me banana pudding made with Splenda. It still had bananas, it still had wafers, it was still good, so it's still off the list. So I ate it over three days instead of eating it all at once, Mr. Gold, as I would have done all of my, my life. And I was happy every time I ate it. But it, it's fleeting. It doesn't keep me from wanting some more tomorrow. Other differences between mere happiness and biblical joy? One leads to the death which is eternal. The other is temporal. Thank you, Mr. Goad. One leads toward that which is temporal of the moment. The other is eternal in focus. You think about Hebrews 12, how Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Nothing happy in shame. Nothing happy in the moment and being beaten nearly to death. 
nothing happy in the moment in suffocating to death on the cross and on that cross bearing the sins of every person who ever lived. But joy, joy in fulfilling the will of the Father, it is finished. Joy in opening the doors of the kingdom so that we who are willing to die with Christ in baptism can be raised with Christ to newness of life. Joy in that many souls will be brought to the Father. Tremendous joy. Anything else you'd like to say there about the differentiation of happiness and joy? Joy is more spiritual or happiness is more physical. Thank you. That's well said. Joy, more spiritual. Happiness, often more physical. It is my habit in nature, in case it bugs you, I apologize. I assume we have people with us online. And since we have people on us online and I'm not certain about the mic picking up your good comments, I like to repeat them so that the folks who are with us at home can be with us as, as much as feasible. Plus, it just helps me enjoy your good comments. So I'm, I'm good with that both ways. We're not anti-happy, but we don't want to be shallow and flippant. Happiness is often not paradoxical. It's just flat out simple. Joy is often paradoxical. You get up on a Sunday morning, you don't feel real good. Nothing seems to go exactly right with the getting ready sort of process. And you wonder if you're going to be able to get here to be with the saints and stir one another up to love and good works, a genuine work of joy. But you do right because you do right. And you get here and find out you've blessed somebody. They're happy to see you. You're happy to see them. You've lived up to Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. You've lived up to John 13, 34, and 35. You've lived up to Philippians 2, 1 through 4. And you feel so much better about that. That commitment, that value, that sound practice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Some keys to joy and celebration. One would be in the Lord. Whatever we do in the Lord as Christians with the word of Christ dwelling in us richly in honor of God, in accord with the mission of Christ, there's a bunch of blessing wrapped up in that. And we just absolutely love those blessings. In my best judgment, since the Holy Spirit through Paul tells Christians to rejoice, it is possible to choose to do so. I don't believe the Lord wastes words or issues vain commands. It makes me think of that ancient line from the poem, Two men looked out from prison bars. One saw mud, the other stars. Why did the one dude see mud? He looked down. He saw what he looked for and looked at. And why did the other guy see stars? I know it's partly angle of vision, but it's more than that. It's angle and attitude of heart. Rejoice always. An amazing thing. You remember after Peter and John were beaten by the Sanhedrin? And they met with the Christians, the other Christians, and prayed. Do you remember what they rejoiced about or rejoiced in? Their suffering, that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. Enjoyed the beating? No, nope, not at all. Enjoyed the service? Appreciated and valued the service? Appreciated being able to walk in the steps of Jesus Christ? One of our alumni did mission work in Albania for many years. Difficult place that was time locked for a time after World War II and took a long time to wake up and get better. He ran into frequent opposition, many sources, many types. 
And every time he ran into opposition, his communication back to me ran something like, we must be doing something right, otherwise the devil wouldn't be fighting us like he is. And he found joy, motivation, celebration in those challenges and difficulty. To him, they were validation. And I think he was on to something really big there. You remember the Hebrew Christians. The Hebrew Christians, some of them suffered plundering of their goods, their possessions. Our house is in a quiet little neighborhood on a dead end street in the back lot borders Tri-Cities Memorial Gardens. We have excellent quiet neighbors on the back. They never bother us in any way, but we have good neighbors otherwise. It's a dead end street and at the non-dead end of the street is a Florence policeman's house. And so nearly every night a police unit of some sort is parked at the entryway to our street. Now also, one of the people who lives in our house is really odd, and so he has four cow skulls on the front porch, and it would take a really insane robber to burgle a house with four cow skulls on the porch. That, that just doesn't compute on any level. But if we were to ever get robbed, the poor robber would be stunningly disappointed. We don't have anything worth taking, nothing easily liquidated and of any major value at all. We have good insurance and the insurance would probably cover that and we wind up with a better TV and a better set of other things than we have right now. On some level, I'd struggle to find joy in the fact that we got burgled, but I could find joy in the fact that this guy's burgled friends are going to laugh at him if he ever tells them this story. And if he ever gets put in jail, all the prisoners will laugh at him. And we didn't lose much. And besides that, I'm going to be pretty happy that I was burgled instead of did the burgling. I just don't want to go that sinful and bad route. Could you help me think about some ways in which we can increase our godly joy? Ways in which we can increase our celebration quotient. idea of recommitting, rededicating an infusion of zeal. I get that so often. It's one of the reasons I'm, I love getting to teach like I do. Barry Baggett's a missionary, not affiliated with Heritage, but a good Christian fellow. His latest report mentioned one of our alumni, Isaac No. The reason Isaac was mentioned in his good letter about 18, 20 months ago, a seeker contacted Barry wanting to know the way of God more accurately. He read everything on Barry's website, 430 whatever pages. He made a trip to see some New Testament Christians and learn from them. He contacted Barry again another time or two. And after about 20 months, I'm going to be baptized. Send somebody. Lives in a fairly remote village. Isaac Noah was the brother kind of playing the Ananias role from Acts chapter 9, and he went. Turns out he didn't baptize the guy, not just the guy. Baptized the guy and his wife and daughter, and more to come. And I take great joy in that, even though I didn't have a thing to do with it, directly or indirectly. Philip did a good job in the classes with us. The vast majority of our students really do. And one of the things I ask of them on a regular basis is when something good, I'm talking about kingdom good, spiritually good happens, drop us a line. Let us know. And then also tell us, are we allowed to share? Sometimes a conversion is in a third world or an Islamic or communist place and you can't share names. Most of the time you can, we get that permission and we'll share that every time we get a chance. 
you know, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. It's just flat good for us. Other ways that you could advise me to increase my joy quotient, my celebration quotient? Read God's Word. Absolutely. There are books, and you could read them. One is Joy in the New Testament, not written by a brother in Christ, but written by a fellow who believes. It's uh, a little old and maybe hard to find. It's good, but it cannot on any level begin to compete with the original. I love focused Bible study. You've noticed how sometimes the lens through which you read, it doesn't change truth. God's Word is forever settled in heaven. But it does change, improve our understanding of truth in that moment. Part of the writing lately has been, wham, facing life's heavy hits. We're going to do an Old Testament and a New Testament version. Old is done, new is almost done. So been in the Gospels again with some people who took some really major blows and looking at how they dealt with those blows and how God helped them. And it's been fun to do, but it's had me reading the Gospels more carefully again. And then yesterday, today, moved into Book of Acts. Do you remember in Book of Acts what happened to the Ethiopian guy, the treasurer, after he was baptized into Christ. Went on his way rejoicing. The same kind of thing we just read from the end of Acts chapter 2. Where those new Christians were living a life of joy. Absolutely love that business of going to the word of God. On another level. But Ad, he's going to leave this world soon. It appears Laura's mom is going to as well. To the best of our knowledge, both of them faithful in Christ and on their way to a reunion with Jesus. And when my dad passes, just to speak for myself, there's going to be that bit of sadness. I'm supposed to help with his funeral, Philip. And my commission from way back is... Keep it short, keep it simple, don't lie. And I'm going to do my best to do my part of it that way. There's going to be a boatload of joy. Did a graveside service. I'm old now, so I'm doing graveside services for members of the youth group from back when I started. I'll admit he died way too young at only 44. But one of the things we prayed for beside that grave we ask God to give His family vivid memories of the best of His life. The happiest, the most noble, the most fulfilling. And then my request to the family, they don't owe me anything and it's not really homework, it's just a good recommendation, I believe. Please share your favorite stories with one another. Look for the joy. Some of you know that a dozen years ago, we lost our younger son, uh, Alan, after a lung, double lung transplant and, and many complications. We still miss Alan, but it's not a spear to the heart kind of grief anymore. One of the reasons it's not a spear to the heart kind of grief anymore is we think about things Alan would have enjoyed doing or seeing us do. And every year as his birthday rolls around, we pick something and do something godly that Alan might have done. Look for the joy and help create it. If you speak Winnie the Pooh, it will not surprise you at all to know that I am an Eeyore. Philip makes me sound better than I am, and I have to function above Eeyore level to, to teach and keep a job and be civil. But I'm an Eeyore. In my office at school, there are two Eeyores. Little stuffed animal ones, but I pretend they're real. There's also a Tigger that's really little. I could never on my best day with meth be a Tigger. It's just not going to happen. 
But I know some people who have Tigger level joy. Mr. Goat, I'll admit, I have to be around them in small doses. Because if I was around them in big doses, somebody would get hurt. But I need to be around them in small doses. Because I need to learn something from them. I need to catch some of what they have. And that catch what they have. Back to your good comment about new Christian and, and zeal. Every time there's another baptism, we want to ally and align with that new convert and share some of the new perspective and joy and service and all that gratitude they have. It's good for us. Other ways that we might celebrate joy and build joy in doing so. You made a fine list, but we'd love to give you time to add if you wish. Hanging with other Christians who are safe, godly people. You're not going to have to be watching your back or your front or holding your wallet. You're not going to have to worry about uh, dishonoring the prayer of Jesus. Lead us not to temptation because they're just not going to be leading you in that way. That is a good, solid. One of the challenges we give people from time to time, you want to increase joy? Do something new and challenging for Jesus. You don't even have to do it well. You just have to want to do it well. Um, the powers in the gospel, you know, Romans 1, it's not in us. But chances are, if we try hard from a good heart to do something to honor Jesus, there's going to be a set of victories associated with that and really love it. If I could give you one piece of homework about joy, this would be my piece of homework, digitally or not. If you want to write on paper old fashioned, start your own joy book. The joy book is really simple. Only joyful things go in the joy book. If you need a diary or a grief book or whatever, get you another book. Only joy in the joy book. And you make one entry at least every day. There's no Bible verse telling you to do that. This is just a practical sort of matter, common sense. Do you know what your brain does when you make a commitment? Your brain works on it even when you don't know it. You decide to do that joy book, you'll wake up in the night thinking, I've got my joy entry for today already. Just dreamed it. Joy book, you know you're gonna be looking mud, stars. You're gonna be way more looking to stars even above the stars, beyond the stars to God and it tends to do wondrous things to help on days that are really severe read your own joy book until mood is elevated and faith is lifted up don't let me make this more complicated than it is joy book saw a beautiful curly headed loud mouthed kid great to see glad I don't have to take this kid home that is joy book entry, just as real as it can be. Saw a red bird, beautiful, did not leave deposit on my windshield, happy. Just go with that and be joyful. Got what I ordered at the restaurant. We're on a little roll of not necessarily getting what we ordered. Joy there enough. And then you can do the elevated, more spiritual things anytime they arose. For some of you tonight, the joy book could be odd person came from Florence, did odd lesson, stayed awake anyway, did not embarrass my wife. That is happy stuff for the joy book. Paul's got some better stuff. Part of this deal is being sure that we're patient and practice that patience. We don't get in our own way. Part of that is the business of rejecting worry. Worry is the opposite of joy. Worry will cut the heart out of us. Worry is a lot like shoveling smoke. You do physical activities, but nothing changes for the better. More than rejecting worry, the idea is 
in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. A huge part of joy is casting our cares on Him because He cares for us. Who will do a better job of taking care of us? Me? God? It's going to be God every time without any fail at all. And then there's one more huge thing here with verse 8. We're supposed to think on some important things. Think on the things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. News doesn't do that often. News in our culture, if it bleeds, it leads. Unless they're people who are blown up. And the blown up pieces of people are always going to be head of the single murders. And that is just as sad as it can be. We need to lift our eyes, not close our eyes, to the sins and challenges of this world. But this is still God's world. I taught practical evangelism last semester. 20 whatever students. A number of those students, really young, new Christians. And the devil was working really hard to get them back. But they were working really hard to stay with Jesus. We had them do journal. An entry a day for the entire semester. And some of those journal entries about their evangelistic efforts, their faith, their victories, their family members they brought to Jesus, they just teared me up. If you were to walk by my office in the library, I'm as likely as not to be sitting there in my nest behind my screen, tears running down the face, and you'd wonder what's wrong. And on those occasions, it wasn't what's wrong. It was what's way right. Sweet right. If you have any degree of excess joy and celebration about you. Find a friend and loan them some. If you do believe in biblical joy and appreciate celebration of that joy, absolutely don't celebrate alone. Invite people, if I can call it a party, invite them to the party. You know, we're not talking about drunken revelry. We're talking about here rejoicing in the presence of God. Share the victories. It's not bragging. Philip will give you my email. If you feel funny about sharing the victories with people here, share them with me. I'll enjoy it. And I promise I won't do any negative judging about this thing. Transformed by joy. It'll make us more optimistic. It'll make us more faithful. Transformed by celebration. It'll teach us to share our joy in Jesus with others. And use the blessings of God to motivate, encourage, shield, and protect. We just absolutely love the way joy can change our lives. If I've ever had a sign or an omen that it was time to quit, that's it. Um, there are a thousand more things we could say, but I want to thank you because you've done a good job of saying important biblical things in a practical and clear way. Everything we're talking about in terms of transformed by celebration is dependent on being faithful in Christ. Can't save ourselves. The devil will give us temporary happiness from time to time because he knows he's going to slice, dice, and burn us at the end. God will let us endure some tough things from time to time because he knows perseverance builds character which builds hope and nothing shines in joy and celebration like hope in Jesus.
If tonight you need to put on Christ in baptism for remission of sins, or if tonight as a Christian you need the prayers of brethren, you can be part of some joy in heaven and here. You'll let us know that, even right now, as we stand, as we sing.